Hello and welcome friends. I, on the behalf of Osana's Foundation, I welcome all of you for another session of Osana's Dialogues. Today we are going to discuss a very crucial topic amidst the changing world order and a very turbulent global security situation. So today, the title, the theme of our session is Intelligence, Cooperation and Security Challenges in the Emerging World Order. And we are joined by a, uh, an eminent panel of experts, people who are very accomplished, people who have had long experience in the field of intelligence, strategic studies and security affairs. Our panel today is joined by Mr. Namit Verma. Mr. Namit Verma was a student of JNU. He is an expert on global geopolitics with a specialization in security matters. He was the editor of the only magazine on security domain in late 80s and 90s, which was named Security Controls. He has worked closely with the government of India in the past. He has unparalleled knowledge in the field of security issues, which he is still uh, and he is still consulted by the government on various critical matters of security uh, and foreign policy. Then we have Mr. Joseph Rosen. Joseph Rosen is an expert on geopolitics and national security. He is the CEO of Solaris Global Partners and a fellow at Miscav Institute of National Security. And he also worked with the National Security Advisors Office in the Israeli government. Then we have Professor Kobe Michael. Professor Kobe Michael is a senior researcher at INSS and a visiting professor at International Center for Policing and Security, University of South Wales, UK. Professor Michael served as the Deputy Director General and the head of the Palestinian desk at the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. He was a member of the faculty at Ben Gurion University, a senior faculty member at Ariel University and a visiting professor at Northwestern University in New York and Peking University in Beijing. He has published widely in his field, including 20 books and monographs and over 100 articles and chapters and books and has been awarded several academic prizes, among them the Yeriv Prize, Shetshik Prize, so please correct me if I am pronouncing it wrongly, and Yitzhak Sadeh Prize and the Israeli Association for Political Science Prize awarded for the best book of 2008 and 2009. So yes, today we are here with a very expert panel of uh, uh, people who have uh, done really great work in the field of geopolitics. And without wasting much time, I'm going to start the interview so this panel discussion today. So my first question is basically, uh, it's addressed to all of you and uh, you can just take it one by one. I would like to know from you the theoretical premises for the intelligence sharing between nations. I mean, I know that it's something which is mostly taken care of by the practitioners in the field, the spy agencies and all, but definitely we have people from the academic side, people from the think tank side working on this area. And uh, if you would like to share your thoughts in this particular, on this particular topic, please feel free. Yeah, so, so sorry for, uh, for being on mute. Um, yeah, so regarding intelligence um, and in the context of the 7th of, of October, uh, I would like to start with uh, one very important notion um, about the the sense of failure of the intel of the Israeli intelligence uh, uh, apparatus uh, following the seventh of October. Uh, many, including my my friends in India, uh, considered the seventh of October as the biggest failure. Of the intelligence uh, apparatus of, uh, in Israel, which for many years considered to be um, a global power uh, in intelligence, uh, so it's important to um, to clarify things um, because the the current um, the, the the current situation or the perception of the intelligence system in Israel uh, doesn't do justice with with what really happened uh, um, on the 7th of October. And in that context, it is important to distinguish between um, the Israeli capabilities of analyzing the intelligence, the um, gathering and, and collecting the information and the intelligence, and uh, the other level or, or failed of uh, transforming uh, this valuable intelligence 
uh, into operational actions and, and steps. Um, so in the context of 7th of October, the main failure is also the investigation team uh, um, established in Israel found the intelligence collected by the Israeli intelligence apparatus was pretty accurate. Um, the Israeli intelligence had most of the uh, uh, details about the plans and the intentions of, uh, um, of Hamas terror organization. And therefore the main failure was in transforming that valuable raw intelligence into uh, decision making and, and operations. And one of the results for this failure is um, the years long uh, misconception, the security misconception that led also to the uh, interpreting of the intelligence along the lines of that same uh, misconceptions, um, which eventually led to not not quite ignoring, but overlooking uh, what was actually under our our nose and, and eyes. Thank you very much, Joseph, uh, for your comments. I'll come back to you, but before that, I would like to invite uh, Professor Kobe Michael to share his thoughts on the subject. And also, sir, uh, we would like to know the current status of this Israel-Hamas uh, conflict and where it is ultimately headed to. Do you think that uh, are there any chances of ceasefire or it is going to escalate, exacerbate? Please. Over to you, Professor Michael. Hello. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, it looks that um, we are in a sort of a strategic limbo now because uh, we are uh, uh, facing the um, uh, hostages uh, uh, negotiation, waiting to uh, Hamas response, uh, where I think that uh, there is a very, um, very uh, small uh, or low probability that uh, Hamas will, uh, will respond positively because um, they uh, understand, that, and when I say they, I mean the leadership of Hamas in the Gaza Strip, they understand the, or think that the time works in favor of them, and not only the time, but the entire international community, including the United States of America. Um, they uh, believe that they are in a sort of a win-win situation, which means that uh, either uh, they will accept the, they will have a deal according to their conditions in a way that they will remain the sovereign power in the Gaza Strip and this will be the ultimate victory in their eyes uh, uh, after uh, seven, uh, seven months of uh, war. Um, or uh, if um, uh, the, the deal, uh, the negotiation will fail, then Israel will have to uh, launch uh, a ground operation in Rafah and uh, then Israel will find itself uh, pushed to the corner by the international community that will criticize harshly Israel. And uh, the tension between Israel and the United States uh, that objects the operation in Rafah will increase as well. So in both cases, uh, Hamas uh, will come out uh, with uh, the upper hand according to, to their understanding. And therefore, they have no incentive to do any further concessions or to be more flexible with regard to the terms of uh, of the deal and uh, therefore i think that uh, we are um, we are not close to a ceasefire in the gaza Strip. and uh, i believe that uh, at the end of the day um, israel uh, will find itself uh, only with uh, one option which is uh, uh, the, the ground operation in Rafah, because the war in the Gaza Strip cannot be ended without dealing with Rafah and not only the, the, the capacities of, uh, of Hamas in, uh, in Rafah itself, in Rafah area, but also Philadelphia Corridor, which is the border between uh, Egypt, Sinan Peninsula and the Gaza Strip, where beneath this corridor, which is 13 kilometer length, there is a huge infrastructure of smuggling tunnels, 
which are used uh, as the ultimate uh, oxygen pie of uh, the terror infrastructure in the Gaza Strip. And if this will not be blocked in a very effective manner, then Hamas will be able to recover itself, to reconstitute itself very rapidly. And therefore, I think that uh, in order to realize the objectives of the war, uh, uh, which are uh, the dismantling of Hamas as a, as a military and governmental uh, uh, entity in the Gaza Strip and to release the hostages, Israel will remain with no option but to deal with, uh, with Rafah and to uh, continue dismantling uh, Hamas in a way that will assure that Hamas will not be able to become once again an effective a ruler of the Gaza Strip or any other Palestinian territory. But in the very same time, I would like to mention and to emphasize that this crisis might be a turning point, a strategic turning point for Israel, if Israel will be able together with the United States and with the Saudis to establish the new regional architecture that will deal with Hamas um, as a as a regional threat or as a regional challenge, and not only as a sole Israeli threat or sole Israeli business. And um, if such an architecture will be established and uh, will take responsibility for the dismantling of um, the, the left capacities of Hamas, then uh, we might reach to the phase that uh, Hamas capabilities in Rafah will be dismantled by Hamas itself, not vis-a-vis -vis Israel, but vis-a-vis -vis the Egyptians, for example, or vis-a-vis -vis the Saudis. And then um, uh, this will be, I would say, uh, the ultimate exit strategy for Israel from the war. And this will be a very significant strategic achievement because um, uh, the establishment of the new regional architecture uh, will be or will create a counter axis to the to the resistance axis, which is led by Iran, where Hamas is one component of this axis. And therefore, the outcomes of the war will be the full realization of the objectives of the war that uh, the Israeli government set, which are the dismantling of Hamas as a military and governmental power in the Gaza in the Gaza Strip, uh, eliminating the security threat from the Gaza Strip and changing uh, the security conditions, weakening the Iranian axis and releasing the hostages. But uh, I think that uh, we are still in a sort of a very complicated situation. I hope that Israel will be able, together with its partner, to to create this turning uh, turning uh, point, but uh, we still have a journey in front of us. Yes, thank thank you, Professor Michael. Just one quick question before I uh, before I ask Mr. Namit Verma. Uh, so, uh, what we saw between uh, is Israel and Iran recently that appears to be like a dress rehearsal of a, one big event in the future. Reportedly, Iran has already reached of 60% enrichment of their uranium, which is a weapons grade level. How are you going to handle Iran if they, if they really have like credible nuclear capability in the future or very soon they might, they are likely to have it. How are you going to handle it? Quickly, you know, because I have to uh, ask Mr. Yes. Namik. Uh, first of all, we have to remember that uh, the war in the Gaza Strip is not a limited local war between Israel and Hamas only. This is a, a reflection of a much broader war, which is a regional war with global impact. This is a war uh, uh, of Israel, a multi-front war of Israel, uh, where Iran is uh, eventually the hand that shakes the cradle, okay? Uh, Hamas is another proxy of Iran among some other proxies here in the broader Middle East. Now, um, unfortunately, uh, the most significant player with regard to Iran is the United States of America. And as long as the U.S. will continue providing Iran with a comfort zone, which means that as long as the U.S. will be reluctant uh, from attacking uh, Iranian assets or from uh, um, um, uh, making a, a much more severe uh, economic sanctions against Iran uh, and will continue to appease Iran, then uh, Iran will feel free to continue behaving as the bully of the neighborhood by using its proxies. 
Uh, I think that uh, the U.S. and its policy is the key in order to restrain Iran. And on the other hand, the establishment of the, the new regional architecture that will be a counter axis to the Iranians and will weaken the Iranians dramatically with regard to their abilities here in the broader Middle East. Uh, so, Mr. Verma, uh, first of all, uh, given your experience, you know, vast experience in dealing with the strategic matters, both as a practitioner and also as a theorist, I would like to ask you throw, to so, throw some light on the, you know, the theoretical part of the intelligence sharing uh, between different nations and then come to the history of intelligence sharing between India and Israel. Which, okay, I'll, I'll take it as uh, you suggest first. Uh, uh, You're not audible, uh, Mr. Verma. Your voice is... Am I, am I audible now? Yes, yeah. it's better now. Yes, yeah. What Professor was saying is a reflection of uh, and what uh, Joseph earlier was talking about. He was talking about a lapse in communication inside Israel uh, between the gathered intelligence and the uh, actionable intelligence. Now, uh, and you are asking about uh, intelligence sharing between countries, I understand. Yes. Uh, especially when you say between India and Israel. So, we have this, uh, each of these issues is relevant. What Professor was talking about and uh, of how Hamas is seen or uh, Hezbollah is seen as an Iranian uh, in, uh, front or, a, uh, or an alter ego or whatever. So also the Arabs would tend to see Israel as, uh, you know, as the uh, Middle Eastern representative of the Middle Eastern Pax Americana. So, uh, it would be on, uh, you know, everybody has a role to play, to, to play and that is what the theory helps us to, uh, to dissect. That every nation, the first premise in such uh, situations, which we all understand and which we all accept that no nation is utopian. Otherwise, the nation states of the world wouldn't exist. And if the nation states do not qualify as a utopian con construct, if they are necessarily constructs uh, which are imperfect, then they must at their basis have something which, is, uh, which weakens them. Those are the key national secrets of a nation. If they were to unravel, the state unravels. And what we are seeing today from, uh, there was a, you also talked about the, the changing world order. So that threatens the changing world order as well, because even the most powerful of nations tend to have uh, secrets at, at the basis of their existence, which could unravel. And uh, the problems that we are seeing in Israel today, which Professor was uh, talking about in much greater detail. Now, those are inherent to the nature of Israel and the way the history of uh, how it was created in 46. And uh, Israel really has no option but to fight it out till the end. They have, uh, for all the diplomatic speak, the Israeli state can never really reconcile with the concept of a two state uh, solution in uh, in that part of the world for uh, in the Sinai. But the diplomatic speak, including from its uh, mentor America, favors uh, the two state version. So this is where. The obvious, uh, you see, if you were to do a theoretical analysis of the situation, then it becomes obvious that these contradictions will always be there. And one must uh, also recall that Israel, when it came into existence in 46, the world order was very different from what it is today. And the concept to, uh, to position Israel in Palestine is much older than 46. It goes back to 1917 when uh, the British government first uh, 
communicated to the uh, to the Jewish uh, movements in uh, Europe, in primarily in Britain and uh, Ireland, but across the world, that they would support such a uh, such a nation in Palestine. And then, as the world, because of the situation of Israel, because of uh, the character of Israel, it was forced to go along with whosoever is the leading world power of the day. As the British faded and the Americans uh, emerged as the leading world power after the Second World War, despite the earlier sponsorship, you had that famous episode of uh, Lord Moyne's assassination, which then Israel obviously did not uh, concur with. It took them 25 years to uh, to accept that uh, it had their clearance. But with that act, they transferred their allegiance to America. Today, the Middle East is in great turmoil, but even more than the Middle East being in turmoil is the, is the entire world and the, and the monetary balance of the world is in, is in turmoil, largely because of the immense American borrowing. They've done themselves it. And as the surplus countries in the world tend to be, many of them tend to be in that region, the, the oil exporting countries. So their influence is going up. The need to ensure the continuity of Pax Americana, which keeps those countries supportive of the US dollar. Uh, there are cracks in that. Recently, they have shifted to trading in other currencies. In the past, we've seen when Libya first tried to uh, to bring about the idea of shifting oil trade from the dollar to an alternate currency, we saw the wars that resulted there. Now there are Middle Eastern countries which have already shifted to trading in, uh, in directly with the ruble, which is sanctioned, and with the Chinese and with the Indian rupee. All these things will impact the global balance it does undermine Pax Americana in the Middle East. And uh, it brings about enormous pressure on survival pressure uh, for Israel. And perhaps they see that before there, is, uh, before there is a shift in the overall balance against them, it is necessary for them to secure themselves uh, within the present framework. So these are these are theoretically uh, these are issues that you can establish. As regards the issue of exchange of intelligence uh, in exchange uh, of sharing, now Israeli intelligence sharing is presumed to be largely with the Western uh, peers. Now, of course, there is a substantive uh, sharing uh, with India. There is presumably uh, a serious uh, intelligence sharing exercise ongoing with some Arab states which are forward looking. At the same time, uh, there would be communication with hostile states, but back channel, but not necessarily sharing. And the failure to process if, 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 the, invest, if the intelligence was there as uh, uh, Joseph says, then the failure to bring to make it actionable is not merely that of the Israeli establishment, but of all the peers it uh, collaborates with in making it actionable. A theoretical analysis would require whether somebody suppressed that existing intelligence. Suppression is usually done when parties are unsure they delay, they buy time. So those are, you know, those are postmortems which will, which we, which people will go into, in time. Today it's still a live wire situation. So that is how I see the link between theory and we, and far as India and Israel, we've had, uh, we've had, we've we've had a blow hot blow cold uh, relationship for long. There are times when we have. Uh, had a lot of active uh, flow going on. Then again, it has uh, 
seized and again it has come up the fact that we were both uh, that both these two entities came into existence around the same time and uh, the lead player from whom we inherited our nationhoods at that time was britain they were the, the palestinian mandate was with them and india of course was part of the british empire so uh, both would be impacted necessarily and our especially our relationship would be impacted by what britain was willing to bequeath to us and the framework it would have designed uh, keeping its own interests in mind that is equally evident in the great indian rivalry with china we we live that history to the till this date so all those history theory compulsions all these things play i think uh, that i hope that answers your question mr verma uh, just you you mentioned briefly about the india israel intelligence cooperation i mean uh, do you remember uh, any few like particular incidents where we had this you know really remarkable cooperation with israel and which impacted the critical events of that time i mean if if, if you can share something like that you no know, we would really uh, like to know about it then i'll get back to joseph and dr michael you know sharing intelligence uh, is a is tricky business but there are some episodes that have been talked about and so we can uh, perhaps refer to them uh, maybe not in their entirety they may not have been talked about but which is known like in recent history uh by recent of course i mean the last three decades or four decades very critical information the most critical information perhaps that israel ever shared with us was uh that it shared certain transcripts relating to a possible threat to our late prime minister's life for late former prime minister's life uh, rajiv gandhi that of course would constitute one of the most critical pieces of information that ever uh, was shared by them and uh, eventually uh, as the situation played out we saw Uh, the, the threat was uh, the threat fructified when the when the threat materialized then all kind then retrospective uh, uh, you know uh, but the the issue is that once such a threat fructifies then again there is a change in political dispensations and when there is a change in political dispensations sometimes the kind of cooperation which was uh, evident when rajiv gandhi was alive israel found it viable to alert him and the indian nation of the threat which was there once he was no more and the uh, and the political dispensations in india were very different nations have to work with each other on a day to day present day basis so then the uh, situation arose wherein that particular piece of uh, intelligence got uh, misplaced removed whatever in india of course we reconstructed the material based on uh, correspondence with other files but we asked uh, the uh, the when the indian government sought to uh, an, sought another copy of the same transcript israel never provided it so uh, you can't have a more glaring uh, episode of where the politics of the day determines how you share intelligence or you don't because it is a reflection of the relationship between two countries that sounds really very interesting and scary uh, if i just can add a bit more to it okay why wasn't the original script Uh, not uh, provided or, and, or, or, or what was the action recommended actually after the intelligence initial intelligence was shared and was there any follow up on that or i mean can you just give us some more details about it well the initial intelligence uh, impacted not uh, the 
was not merely about the assassination of our prime minister. It was about it was about a trigger which uh, which caused assassinations across the world. And uh, uh, that would probably not, as we repeatedly see, at that point of time, India was critical. The Soviet Union had still not disintegrated. India was official back channel or unofficial back channel between the US and the Soviets. Uh, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi was individually and personally a part of that uh, of that um, communication. And the other leader who, uh, the other country which was impacted, Sweden. Uh, Mr. Pame and Rajiv Gandhi were the twin sponsors of a new North-South dialogue at that point of time. So, whenever global equations are, uh, are undergoing a change, that situation was similar to what is happening now. At that point of time, they handled it the way they did. Every time there is a threat to, uh, to an existing world order, then these events happen. And despite that, history has taught us that these events, that these challenges to the global world order will always be there. After all, America succeeded in replacing Britain uh, as the leader of the pack. And uh, if you look to our own history, uh, let us say the history of the Indian subcontinent. So we have had these transitions from Mughal India to British India to independent India and before that to several other Indias. So the known world always goes through uh, transformations. There may be an unwillingness to, uh, to contemplate what was and what is and what is going to be, but these things happen. This particular transcript was, uh, was effectively, it effectively said that payment had been made. It said, God man has made payment. Now, what could be more, uh, and obviously in the, on the back channel, uh, there, was, uh, an, uh, there was a complete uh, preface to what that payment had been made for. All this is documented in various places, but uh, it has been documented and undocumented. So uh, we are aware of, uh, this uh, as to the question of how it impacts well um, our intelligence agencies took cognizance of it they created an immediate uh, security alert they asked uh, for crash z security to be provided to mr rajiv gandhi the government of the day failed to provide it the situation was identical to what joseph was talking about the intelligence was there the political actioning uh, was not there. The government of the day didn't provide it. The previous, uh, there were two prime ministers uh, in succession who either didn't agree or for whatever reason didn't provide it. The previous one, uh, there was actually a discussion about restore, about not reducing his uh, securities uh, from the earlier standards. And uh, Mr. VP Singh's, uh, inside his cabinet, there was dissension. A senior cabinet minister suggested that uh, the security should not be downgraded, but he went ahead with it. And all this was part of uh, and parallel with other concessions, which were being made for uh, to the world order, which was uncomfortable with Rajiv Gandhi and the Congress party. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Namit. I'll come back to you. Before that, I have questions for uh, Joseph and Dr. Michael. Uh, so it is being uh, generally mentioned in muted tones that most of the other Arab countries, that's it, Saudi, UAE, Jordan, Egypt, they are in a way uh, not very disappointed with what Israel is doing with Hamas. So I would like to know a little bit more about Israel's intelligence yes. cooperation with these Arab countries and also the vision of these or Arab countries regarding this whole Palestinian issue. First. Second, uh, I, I guess you must be knowing about it, that uh, a big base of Hamas has already emerged in Malaysia. 
uh, and the Malaysian government is very uh, is providing a very I would say you know comfortable and convenient environment for the Hamas uh, you know fugitives and the people who are escaping from that. And uh, uh, from my friends who are working there in think tanks, I am told that like uh, it's emerging as a big center. So uh, if after this contact, uh, most of the Hamas cadres or some of their commanders, if they shift to Malaysia and operate from there, uh, how is Israel going to tackle that? Yeah. So if if yeah, if if I may first uh, uh, relate yeah. to to what uh, Vemas was talking about and moving from history to and theory to practice, um, it's important to um, to point out that the bilateral intelligence cooperation between Israel and India um, is based on on a common ground and shared interests in combating terrorism and radical Islamists. Um, and that is at the core of the co of the cooperation between between the countries. Uh, only ju just yesterday, or uh, maybe it was two days ago, um, there was a, um, a drill, security drill around the Israeli embassy in New Delhi uh, with the uh, Indian authorities, security authorities. And this kind of a cooperation in physical security, but also in sharing intelligence, and uh, I would add also cyber and R and D uh, um, in relevant technologies, um, is a very um, very important message to any potential uh, attackers on on Israeli uh, Israeli diplomats or Jewish centers in India. And unfortunately, both countries, Israel and India, um, experienced uh, many terror attacks, uh, including uh, uh, Israeli and Jewish targets in India. Um, so this this cooperation and 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 the prospect of uh, deepening this cooperation is very important also for for the future and the prevention of of. Uh, um, such future uh, terror attacks. Now, regarding your question uh, um, about sharing intelligence sharing with Arab countries, um, I would connect it to the to the direct Iranian attack against Israel, um, and some of the. Uh, um, the implications of the direct Iranian attack against Israel was um, the revival of the this security uh, um, security and intelligence sharing um, architecture in the Middle East, led by the U.S. Um, and including uh, pragmatic Arab countries. Um, it is also important to point out that in in a very high probability, one of the motivations behind the 7th uh, of October attacks was the Iranian interest shared also by Russia and China to, um, to stop any, to disrupting the shaping of this new architecture. So what basically the direct Iranian attack did uh, was reviving this architecture. And there were some reports about um, intelligence sharing and even coordination um, between Israel and Arab countries um, in the effort to intercept the drones and ballistic missiles uh, launched from, from Iran directly on Israel. Um, and hopefully that example of cooperation with countries that Israel doesn't even have diplomatic relations with, um, such as Saudi Arabia, can also lead to, um, to pragmatic cooperation in other fields, not only in security and intelligence, but also in uh, technology and, 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 um, and economy. And in that context, I think that India can play uh, a significant role in bridging um, 
bridging the two sides and even broadly bridging between the Indo-Pacific and the Middle East. And one of the ways to do it uh, is to find specific projects um, along the lines of IMEC and using IMEC in building or shaping this new architecture in the Middle East. And of course, one of the components can be intelligence uh, sharing. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, there was one article yesterday or day before yesterday. It was about uh, the possibility of India mediating between Iran and Israel. Is it? Do you think it's realistic or it's just a very you know idealistic imagination? My Professor Michael, you both of you can take up this question. I mean, personally, I find yes, it uh, some kind of a poet, poetic imagination. But you you can share uh, your thoughts. As, as, as... As I said, in India can play a significant role. I'm not sure it's willing to mediate between Israel and Iran. Um, but anyway, as, as I said before, I think realizing uh, interregional projects like IMEC can change the reality in the region without actually mediating between uh, uh, two specific parties. Professor Michael, uh, would you like to share some thoughts on my questions? I mean, you want me to repeat the questions or it's okay? Which, which question? The first one or the second with regard to first the one and potential second in, uh, Indian, well, first one and Indian second role? Both. I can see you are smiling. Mm -hmm. You have something really interesting to share with all of us. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yes, I read the article that, uh, that you have mentioned. Uh, and I think that... Uh, that uh, at least uh, theoretically, uh, India has uh, the potential to be uh, a sort of a mediator because uh, it has very good relations with both, with Iran and with, and it, respect, it is respected by both. Secondly, uh, India is uh, is a global power, not less than that. Not only because uh, uh, India has uh, the. Uh, the biggest uh, population in the in the world, but because India became to be an, uh, a very significant economic power, a very significant military power, and a very significant political power, and uh, therefore I think that um, uh, any um, I would say aspiration of uh, the Indian government uh, to take a more active role. Uh, in some global affairs uh, will contribute to the to the position of uh, of uh, india as a, as a global power but in order to do that okay you cannot remain uh, i would say uh, disconnected or natural uh, till till the end i mean at the end of the day you have to have an idea you have to have a set of values you have to have a set of interests okay now, um, uh, the United States of America as a global power have a very clear interest and very clear set of values. It uh, it didn't um, it didn't prevent it didn't prevent uh, the, the United States from being a mediator in many conflicts around the globe, including the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Okay, uh, so you don't have to identify with Iran. Uh, exactly or in a very balanced manner as you identify with Israel, because you know who is bad, who is evil, and who is good in this regard, okay? Uh, and you don't have to identify with the Palestinians as well as you identify uh, with Israel, because you know who is the evil and who is the good in this regard. But you have to have a voice, and I think that you have to have a more active role and I think that uh, that uh, at the end of the day, it is very uh, very crucial even to to the to the global to the global balance and to the global order that India will contribute its uh, its part. Uh, but uh, it looks that uh, it is still a theoretical potential. Okay, it's not uh, something which is uh, which is uh, valid or something which is tangible right now. Now, uh, with regard to the first question um, uh, about uh, intelligence sharing, I would like to remind uh, our viewers that, uh, first of all, Israel has uh, peace treaties uh, with uh, Egypt uh, and Jordan for many decades, For with Egypt more than four decades, uh, with uh, Jordan, uh, uh, now we are talking about three decades. Um, 
And uh, we uh, used to have a very close strategic cooperation with these two countries. Uh, and when I'm talking about strategic cooperation, I'm talking about the uh, intelligence uh, cooperation as well. And uh, I think that um, the, the strategic channels are very broad and uh, they, they, they flow very, very effectively. In contrary, by the way, to the people to people relationship between uh, between the countries or between the peoples, because Israel is very criticized, even demonized and delegitimized by uh, the, the the publics in the in Jordan and Egypt, and this is a, an outcome or a fruit of many many uh, decades of uh, indoctrination against Israel, and now uh, the Jordanian and the Egyptian authorities find themselves in a very complicated situation when they understand. Uh, who is the good, who is the good and who is bad, and they understand that it is very crucial to be uh, uh, in one camp together with Israel and with the United States. But they are facing uh, a very high level of criticism among their constituencies. And following the so-called Arab Spring, they have to be very sensitive to the to their local voices, okay, uh, to their publics. And they are in a sort of, a, I would say, a trap or catch-22 in this regard. But uh, in addition to Egypt and Jordan, we uh, traditionally and historically, we have very good relations with regard to, to intelligence cooperation with uh, many other Arab countries and, and, uh, and Muslim countries uh, um, for, for many, many years. And uh, there is no doubt that there is a very, very, a very deep um, um, security, including intelligence cooperation between Israel and the, and the Gulf countries, between Israel and Morocco, between Israel and some other uh, Arab and the Muslim countries around the world. And uh, I think that it is very crucial, and very important and very respected and appreciated by those Arab and Muslim countries, because Israel is a, is a global superpower, okay, with regard to intelligence. Israel has a huge and very impressive capacities with regard to intelligence, and not only because of a very high level of technology, but because uh, of uh, many other reasons as well. And this is in brackets, I would say, going back to the things that have been said by, uh, by Joseph um, at the opening of the session, this is uh, one of the, the sources to the huge frustration that we feel here in Israel, how it comes that uh, with such capabilities, with such high level, of intelligence, where all all the the information was there. Okay, we failed like we failed in the October seventh. I mean, the gap is is uh, just. Uh, um, I mean, uh, it's it's unbelievable. It's something which is very very frustrating. Um, now, um, I would like to remind uh, in this regard, talking about intelligence uh, cooperation that Israel and the Arab countries, and when I say the Arab, the Arab countries, I mean the, the, the Arab Sunni pragmatic countries, okay? Those uh, countries that belong in this way or another to, to, the, to the liberal democratic camp, which is led by the United States. I mean, uh, Egypt, Jordan, uh, the Gulf countries, Morocco. Uh, uh, we have to remember that they, these countries share with Israel common threats. I mean, Iran is a common threat. The Muslim Brotherhood, where Hamas, by the way, is the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. Okay, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is a is a common threat. This is one of the most uh, severe, significant, destabilizing uh, vectors or factors um, uh, in the in the broader Middle East. And uh, the Jihadiya Salafia, all the fundamental extremist uh, jihadi organizations be it the Palestinian Islamic Jihad or even Hamas in the Palestinian arena or ISIS or Al-Qaeda, uh, Jabhat al-Busra and you name it, okay? These are three uh, severe threats which are shared by Israel and the Arab countries and therefore they have a very, uh, I would say, um, a very powerful reason to cooperate and to share intelligence between of them uh, because um, by, by 
by sharing intelligence and by uh, sharing resources and by improving uh, security and strategic cooperation, they improve their capacities to tackle these, uh, these threats, to thwart uh, uh, threats from, from these uh, sources. And, um, and therefore, I think that, uh, this, uh, at the end of the day, is um, the most crucial basis uh, for the establishment of the, the new regional architecture. Uh, and actually, we were in the way uh, to, the, to the establishment of uh, this uh, new regional architecture that has begun uh, to be built uh, in, uh, in, the, in the summer of 2000 by the Abrahamic Accords, okay? Uh, but uh, there is no doubt that Saudi Arabia is the most crucial, the most important Arab players in this regard. And we were in the middle of a normalization process uh, before the eruption of uh, the murderous attack of October 7th. And as you said correctly before, this was one of the reasons uh, to the attack of October 7th, to, to sabotage, to, uh, to undermine these efforts of normalization. And I hope that uh, we will be able to resume them, and this will be the ultimate response uh, to, the, to the efforts that were done by uh, the Iranian Axis, by the Iranian coalition. And I think that um, we are uh, in the way towards uh, this um, uh, objective. Thank you, Professor Michael. Uh, you are absolutely right when you say that uh, regarding your, the, my first question that India is a global power and India is, I mean, I, I think that we are punching below our weight and definitely we need to be a bit more assertive and a bit more active in the global affairs. You know? And so now my next question is to Mr. Namit Verma. Uh, Mr. Verma, in your initial remarks, very subtly you mentioned that, uh, you know, that uh, when the, during, before the Rajiv Gandhi's assassination, there were, there were some mild beginnings of the change in the world order like El precisely and we've seen the global south and the major leader the i guess 90s. i guess to... uh, yes okay so uh, yeah. let, let me finish my question so i guess today also today also we are facing a similar set of circumstances recently in the g20 event we saw that india is more or less emerging as a leader of the global south under prime minister modi's leadership India has established an entirely different signature of its image from what it used to be earlier. It's taken seriously, even the recent Ukraine war, India's initiatives to effect some kind of a peace between the two countries were taken very seriously. So uh, that really adds you know, a, a lot to my worries. You know? I mean, do you think that this can lead to assassinations of those kinds which happened during those times? And secondly, something which adds more weight to this, uh, you know, this apprehension, this fear is that a very turbulent and a volatile security environment in the Middle East. Do you think that, you know, given that if these th the two things are uh, seen in holistic manner or they are combined or even added to with some other factors, it presents some serious dangers uh, to Indian political leadership? Let me put it very bluntly. Do you think that any of our major political leaders or let's say the political heads, prime ministers, can they be assassinated now? We'll come to that. I'll address the first part of your question first. Okay. The, what, the environment today is identical with what was happening in the late 80s and the early 90s. India was very much the leader of the Global South. Rajiv Ji was the face, uh, the global leadership face of the non-aligned movement. And between him and Olaf Pame, they had forged a whole new concept of North-South dialogue. And that was certain, whatever, that whole new global uh, world order was effectively brought to an end with these two assassinations. That uh, is the chilling reminder of what happened then. In today's situation, the biggest problems today that the world, let us say the biggest problems today that the world is, uh, that the world leader is facing is internal, is its own uh, federal deficit. 
It is necessary to note here that the end of the British Empire was maneuvered by the, by the Americans on precisely the same element of government federal deficit. The Americans' refusal to oblige the British demand for loans to the extent that they, it was, they did provide three and a half billion then, but the demand originally was five billion. And it was enough to make the British fall in line, but not to reassert themselves. And Mr. Churchill, the so the so-called great leader of UK, presided over the demise of the empire. But the same thing is happening today. And uh, while many names were mentioned by uh, Joseph and Professor about the pragmatic con Arab countries who are who have a um, significant exchange with Israel, strangely, UAE was not mentioned. Saudi Arabia was mentioned, but UAE was not mentioned. Now, UAE today is the single biggest uh, um, operator in shifting oil currencies from the dollar to the ruble or to the Chinese uh, um, uh, denominated. Uh, so, what you have here, the environment is as unstable as it was in 89 to 91 to 92. And uh, certainly the world order of the day stands shaken. Because we are seeing, we've seen in Ukraine and post-Ukraine, on uh, both in the Ukrainian affair and in the Israeli affair, that there is always a veto in the Security Council by different parties. So the world order is not uh, managing to assert itself as clearly as it was, say, five years ago. China refuses even to acknowledge, to, uh, to, um, uh, like, to accept judgments of the world court. There are clear judgments on territorial issues. China just bounces them into a dustbin. So the world order is being redefined. Israel, as I said at the beginning, has this problem that it will have to, its situation is such that it can never antagonize the leading world power of the day or the leading world powers of the day. It is a button which has been planted in the Middle East by, uh, by the West, building on 2,000 years of biblical history and uh, the Nebuchadnezzar animosity with, uh, with Iraq and Iran. But, to, but just as those issues are dated now, the Arabs also must accept that now it is uh, 80 years since Israel happened. So if the Arabs held that, that territory for uh, 2,000 years or for 1,500 years, then now the current truism is that Israel holds that, ter that territory. The Palestinians have to accept that. The pragmatic Arab states have accepted that. The world order today, we live in postmodern times. In postmodern times, while the legacy of religion is always going to be there in as long as humanity is there. But eventually we have started looking to other der derivatives defining what human goals are. And in that changing world order, the old order will always be challenged. And that is what brings about the friction between the two. India is in the unenviable position that we are, as everybody accepts, we are a large country. We are the largest country in the world in terms of population. We are one of the largest economies of the world. We're going to go, grow bigger in the days to come. How can we be expected to suborn ourselves? We can't. If there is global pressure 
or an Indian leadership to subordinate itself to their interests, that leadership will be opposed at home. The leadership of today is uh, taking a fair number of uh, initiatives. Like in Rajiv Gandhi's time, what happened? Rajiv Gandhi started the, uh, the great move towards uh, software and hardware, which have stood us in great stead till date. We've, uh, in the Indian economy, the economic boom of India has been fueled by that, by the software industry. But Rajiv Gandhi had also started the, ha the hardware technology uh, side of it. But the first thing that happened when he went was he, when he was moved out of power was that it was an act of arson which burnt down semiconductors India Limited. Till then, there were three chip manufacturers in the world, three countries, the US, Taiwan, and India. The Indian chip manufacturing facility, which was at par with that of the rest of the world, was burnt down and never allowed to be rebuilt. The assessment was in 91, I think, that it would take only two, uh, it would take only 100 crore rupees to rebuild the burned down plant. It was never allowed to be built. Today, our prime minister says he wants to go back into chip making. Then let's go back to 1971. You know, like I'm just citing examples which have been at play. In 1971, when Pakistan, uh, it, initially, it was uh, East and West Pakistan were one country. Mr. Kissinger one didn't had it had no desire to listen to what was happening in Bangladesh. You have the now the then American ambassador to Dhaka. His version is now now out the blood report of how he kept telling the State Department about the massacres which are happening. Three million people, massive genocide. But uh, Nixon and Kissinger didn't want to hear. Nixon and Kissinger didn't like Mrs. Gandhi because she stood up for what she felt was right, what India felt was right. And uh, the consequence was, you know, we have all grown up listening to the fact that we're at the peak of 71, the Americans tried to intimidate India by sending the Seventh Fleet into the Bay of Bengal. What was the role of it? What was the role of it vis-a-vis -vis the conflict at hand? There was no role of for the Seventh Fleet vis-a-vis -vis the conflict the the vis-a-vis -vis the conflict at hand. It could not have intervened without creating a global scenario with the Russians getting involved. The Seventh Fleet was moved in because. When countries are created, as I said, Israel was a button planted in the Middle East by the West. India was partitioned at the same time. India was partitioned in a manner in which Pakistan existed on both sides of India and thereby uh, diminished our claims to the, uh, to the Bay of Bengal, to the, continued, uh, to the continuity of the Bay of Bengal stakes. Now, American surveys, and I'm not citing Indian surveys, say that the Bay of Bengal is one of the largest repositories of hydrocarbon reserves in the world, may even rival or exceed the Middle Eastern reserves. The Seventh Fleet arrived in the Bay of Bengal after it was virtually evident that Bangladesh was going to be uh, uh, carved out of Pakistan. It arrived to send a message, do not meddle with the Bay of Bengal. Till, re till very recently, till a month or two ago, India has not engaged in deep sea oil extraction in the Bay of Bengal. It's only last month that we began that process after the Grand Seventh Fleet visit. What the entire so-called Iraq war, the WMD part is is uh, is uh, Desert Storm Two. The first episode, the conflict between Iraq and Kuwait, is about sideways drilling. Indonesia has been really doing side sideways drilling of Indian oil and getting away with it, and we've been quiet. 
Imagine what will happen to the world economy if India were to become a net exporter of oil instead of a net importer of oil. And the truth is that the entire monetary system of the world is flawed. The old civilizations represent the true wealth of the world. The new civilizations are, uh, and the new countries, it's all made believe it's notional money. Since the world went, since, uh, you know, since the gold standard was abdicated in 71, we don't have any real worth of money. It's all money. It may be implemented by the West, but it follows the dictum of, uh, of Mao. That power flows from the barrel of the gun and power dictates the, the worth of money. So in this kind of a world, if we live, there will be reality checks. And every prime minister who has uh, asserted our position is obviously is obviously in the eye of the storm. And uh, one can't deny that uh, that the situation between when uh, Rajiv Ji was uh, had to face that, but he took that stand and he paid the price for it. And finally, today it does appear that this government is taking that stand, or at least. The individual at the top is taking that stand. It is possible that there are other members in this government who are uh, soft peddling issues, as we saw in the decision for uh, oil drilling in the Bay of Bengal, and as we are seeing in the on the decision to uh, uh, to tell the West very clearly after Ukraine that India was not going to be intimidated by the threat of sanctions and that we weren't going to buy oil from the Russians. The fact that we renewed our rupee ruble trade with the Russians. Uh, all these things have uh, ensured that the monetarist balance of world power has shifted. But we can't, uh, if, we were, if we didn't do this, then we would perish as a country. So we don't have an option, we have to do this. Even the United States understands that we have to do this, but it is busy managing a very tricky threat to world order. The flashpoints of Ukraine and the flashpoints of Israel are no different from the flashpoints of, uh, you know, of uh, the murder of Archduke uh, Franz Ferdinand in the First World War, or what happened with Poland in, in the Second World War. To talk of what is evil and what is not evil without a perspective in history is very difficult. Britain abandoned Poland in an attempt to, to maintain world peace. Eventually, it had to go to war with Germany. What is happening here in the Middle East will not be concluded easily. Israel, as I think Professor said, it is uh, their compulsion, they will have to take the war to its logical end if they have to survive. Even though pra the pragmatic nations, and as uh, in terms of the intelligence failure that is that uh, of October 23 that is talked about, that is equally an intelligence, not just an intelligence failure, we discussed the internal aspect of it, of a failure to act on existing intelligence. It is equally an intelligence failure in terms of intelligence sharing with the so-called pragmatic countries. They, uh, they, they did share subsequently. Subse when Iran got back uh, with its uh, drone attack for this attack on its embassy in Syria, despite all the hyperbole, I am sure that Iran was not interested in escalating issues beyond the point it probably was a face saving uh, operation and for all we know they may have uh, signaled to the uh, israelis that something like this will happen you take precautionary uh, the assumption is that you will take precautionary uh, uh, steps but iran also needs to save face with its own community domestically and abroad and here we come to the role of intelligence in Diplomacy, because as I think Joseph mentioned earlier, Mr. Verma, this is, this is very crucial. Because Verma, as Joseph mentioned me. earlier, that's Mr. Verma, can you hear me? Joseph uh, and uh, Professor Michael also, if you can take this question after Joseph. 
We are seeing a lot of protest in the American universities against Israel. Likewise, I mean, we see similar in the uh, in the Western European countries also. How do you read this situation? I mean, this was the situation when the kind of protests which we recently saw in Columbia University, they used to be a common site in JNU, from which Mr. Namit Verma comes and all kinds of sloganeering and you know, very heavy anti-Israel uh, sloganeering. I, I, I went to that university, but I didn't stay there very long. Okay, okay. I, so, I, I joined certainly. Okay. That's a common family. site in, in the American campuses and the, and also in some of the Western European countries also. How do you look at that? Well, I, I, I think it's better to, to hear Bobby about this. Just, just <laughs> one sentence. Uh, I, I think um, many or, or basically all the protests that we are seeing um, in American campuses in the Ivy League universities uh, are all funded and directed by uh, by Qatar um, as part of its broader campaign uh, of uh, supporting Hamas terror organization. Um, and this is just another aspect of uh, of uh, fighting against uh, against Israel. It, it's not a spontaneous uh, um, public movement. Um, that supports human rights or really care uh, cares about the uh, the Palestinian lives. Um, it's um, clearly anti-Semitic, uh, uh, Qatari-funded uh, uh, activity against uh, against Israel and the Jewish people. Thank you, thank you, Joseph, Professor yeah. Michael. Yes, um, uh, I think that uh, it is a very good question uh, in order to summarize, at least from uh, my point of view, and to relate or to connect the question to the um, to the um, uh, to the issue of uh, the war uh, against uh, against Hamas and the Iranian axis. Look, I, I think that uh, eventually we are in the eve of third war, three, third world uh, war. So um, not not less than that. This is the war between the free and civilized civilized world that India is part of it to the uh, tyrannic world uh, to the Islamic barbaric murderous uh, extremist uh, world. And uh, if you think that uh, that the uh, Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood or the Jihadia Salafia intend to stop with Israel, so I think that you have no idea. Because uh, Hamas leaders uh, say that before October 7th and repeatedly after October 7th uh, that uh, the destruction of the state of Israel is only the first phase. And the second phase will be to conquer Rome as the ultimate uh, symbol of Christianity and to uh, reestablish the Islamic, the Islamic Caliphate um, in the first phase from Bangladesh to Marrakesh. And, and the second phase in the entire uh, globe, in the entire world, and in this caliphate, uh, all the infidels, uh, includes the Indians, by the way, all of those who are not Muslims, will have uh, one option and, uh, and only one, to convert to Islam or to be slaughtered. I mean, these are not my words. These are their words, and I suggest uh, and I recommend everybody to believe them, okay, when they say that, because uh, we saw that uh, they, they realized their uh, threats. Um, and uh, therefore, I think that uh, in this regard, Israel is the last fort or the last barrier in front of the incursion of this uh, murderous, barbaric, extremist Islam to the, uh, to the streets of the free world, including India by the way, as long as India is part of the free world. And therefore, I think that this is the time that the entire free world, the entire civilized world has to share um, efforts in order to fight and to tackle effectively uh, the tyrannic world, which is, by the way, based by revisionist uh, superpowers like China and Russia they, that do not accept the existing international order and the American hegemony, okay? And uh, they are willing to support the Iranians and they are willing to support Hamas and they are willing to support anyone that will sabotage or will undermine 
the existing international order. And therefore, in this regard, I think that we are in front of uh, World War III and uh, we have to understand it exactly uh, in connection with uh, the, the last uh, uh, events in the American campuses or the, the huge demonstrations in London or in Hamburg or in any other uh, uh, European, uh, European cities. Here uh, we are witnessing talking about the campuses, okay, and the demonstration. We are witnessing once again um, in the in the existing uh, of a very bizarre red green alliance between the fundamental radical Islam and the extreme liberals, the progressives. Uh, that they have no idea who is Hamas, that they have no idea when they shout in the streets from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. They have no idea where is the river, where is the sea, what is the name of the river, what is the name of the sea, okay? And all of those extreme liberals who are, um, um, uh, I would say, uh, believe in, uh, in the sacred values of human rights, freedom of speech, freedom of organizations, okay, women rights, and so on and so forth, they support Hamas, and they support Iran, okay, and they support the Palestinians, but they support the Palestinians because uh, uh, it is connected to Israel, and because Israel is perceived in, in their perception as part of the colonial world, okay, because they have so... Um, I would say shallow understanding uh, about the world. They talk in slogans, and they, their money, their their minds are uh, are washed. And it's not only Qatarian Qatarian money. And uh, Joseph is right that the, the Qatarians are involved, and the Qatarians are financing the Ivy League universities uh, in in the United States, and not only in the United States. And by their money, they buy everything that they can buy. Uh, in order to uh, to build their position not only as a regional player but uh, as an international player as well, um, and um, uh, this is also I would say an outcome an outcome of uh, uh, influential operations of the Chinese and the Russians that are trying to uh, create a huge chaos uh, among democratic states, mainly the United States, but they work even very hard in Israel. And I do not know what is the situation in India, but I will not be surprised that they work in India as well in order to undermine stability. Because uh, this is this is their aim. This is uh, the weapon that they use. And uh, here we see once again a very bizarre cooperation between Russia, China, uh, Qatar, the radical Muslims, and the progressives. Okay, the the neoliberals, uh, and. Um, uh, I think that uh, this is uh, not less than uh, a waking call for the free and the civilized world, world to, uh, to, 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 to understand where exactly we are standing and to understand the, 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 I would say, the huge and the great scale of the challenge that we have to face. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Michael. Thank you. So now my last question to you, Mr. Namit Verma, coming back to your original point. You know, you and unfortunately, I have to leave. So, uh, what? So I would like to thank you. Are you saying something? Sorry, but I have to. I have to leave. I mean, uh, oh, so no I, worries. I but no. Excuse myself. Please. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, Mr. Verma, can Very you nice. hear me? Yes. Mr. Verma? Yes, yes. 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 So my last question to you, uh, you mentioned about something very serious and something very alarming that, you know, given the rise in India's global stature, again, we are faced with this similar kind of changes to our political leadership, which we had to face in 90 early. I can see that every day yes. we are getting these, this lecturing and sermonizing from the Western countries, whether it's the perceived cases of minority oppression, or over the killings of the you know, Sikh extremists and terrorists in Canada and USA, we can see that there is some kind of intolerance or even a hatred for what India is doing or you know how India is emerging as a great power in this world. So please tell us more about this threat you know of to our political leadership, and I'll request you to be as direct and as specific as you can be. 
and you know this is also in the context of a case which is already pending i don't know i guess many of our audience already remember that there was a case in uh, uh, in maharashtra's bhima korega uh, this is this organization called elgar parishad and uh, uh, they 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 found few people planning to assassinate the indian prime minister i don't know whether that it was really substantial or the investigation is still going on mr rona wilson again from jnu he is behind the bars so are these merely pawns or they have some bigger global actors you know uh, controlling things from across the oceans trying to you know do something really big in india please share your thoughts so if you want to view it as a parallel to what happened okay now uh in the rajiv gandhi case as uh, the main witness before the joint commission of inquiry uh, man sevadas clearly deposed that the move was sponsored by the sikh extremists based in london they may have had agencies uh, behind uh, supporting them that was a different matter for international reasons but he submitted how he had a conversation and uh, the then uh, head of uh, of the face of sikh extremism worldwide jagjit singh chauhan who was earlier the president of the united akali dal president or otherwise undisputed leader of the of the akali dal and at the at that same time uh, seva das was the general secretary of the united akali dal so when he went to uh, to when he was sent by the government of india to discuss other issues when he learned that there was a move afoot to assassinate rajiv gandhi he bought time by advising jagjit singh chauhan don't do it he said you saw what happened in 84 if you repeat it then there will be a boss toll for the sikh community in india so don't show your hand even if you must do it that is how he bought time he aborted his trip his government sponsored trip came back sought time with rajiv gandhi and alerted him that this is what i have heard okay so once again you see similar to what they are talking about in terms of october 23 intelligence were not only there with the uh, with the agencies in the government of india it was there with the victim uh, with the intended victim and who eventually would become the victim but there was no action taken now and then uh, according to the testimony of the of the principal witness before the commission the ltt was uh, brought in as the trigger by the sikhs uh, based in london the ltt has since apologized for its involvement saying that it did not understand the global connotations of what it got involved in and that is the so called basis for some pardons and reprieves that have been granted to them the fact remains that whether they did it without knowing or otherwise they were still guilty of pulling the trigger of sending dhanu uh, with the bomb it is eminently possible that there would be another if there was another such move afoot the trigger would have no idea the trigger is probably uh, you know like uh, they have no idea of what the world is about in the last, when you're talking of an issue like india becoming a net exporter of oil instead of a net importer of oil the issue changes the world trade balance in total you're talking in trillions of dollars now uh, the kind of people who will be swayed by uh, by you know uh, today it appears to be a petty issue at the level of global uh, decision making in a post modern world but it is there and though, and people with such motivations are not really expected to have a very a great horizon of uh, and an understanding of what world affairs are about and it is only somebody it is only somebody with limited intellect who will agree to participate in moves like this and which is why that is the kind of people who are brought in 
the Israeli gentleman, the Israeli professor, who was talking about the role of Qatar. The fact remains that in every, uh, if you are traveling to Africa on a Qatar Airways uh, flight, on each one of them you will find a few free loaders, generally proselyting uh, imams. Now they are not even the best representatives of the Muslim community, but they are the ones who go and feed this frenzy and. Uh, this kind and, and the ones who engender the threat. So it is that category of people who engender threats. And as you said, somebody, you know, in Maharashtra, uh, I'm not conversant with all the details beyond what is there in the media, but the trigger will probably have a dozen cutouts between the trigger and the player. Even the Sikhs in the Rajiv Gandhi assassination case the link has been established till there, till the London Six. Who was supporting them was not established, but what is going on today in Canada and the US could well connect into the same uh, situation. You talked about campuses, and yes, I did go to JNU for a year, and uh, while I didn't complete my course, I did uh, contest uh, elections in that, on that campus. And we never contended, had to contend with uh, police forces inside our campus. That was one of the written, uh, unwritten laws of the campus. But yesterday in, uh, in uh, Colombia, was it, that uh, when these kids were protesting, the police was called in. And I'm told that a lot of Indian students have been intimidated that their visas will be uh, repealed if they uh, continue to, uh, like campus politics is, has also now been equated with national politics over there. So, India is certainly under threat. There is an India which has kowtowed to the West, and there is an India which today is emerging. Emerging India is not a concept with which the West is comfortable. Every time we have tried it, in 47, we tried it and we won against the then power, then uh, global power of the day, the global hegemon Britain, because the arising hegemon America did a deal with us. I know this aspect of Indian history is not uh, understood or talked about much, but it's there for those people who choose to study the balances of the governments of the day, they will find evidence of that. Then we faced this problem with the rise of Indira Gandhi. She was forced into a situation wherein uh, she had to move towards emergency and other unpalatable things. But then uh, Mr. Um, Seymour Hirsch uh, did that classic expose that there were five CIA agents in her cabinet. When Rajiv Gandhi tried uh, to assert India, and he, he actually moved India, India into that slot, becoming the leader of the NAM, becoming the leader of the North-South dialogue, and the leader of the emerging electronic economy of the world. He paid the price for it. The fact that Semiconductors India Limited, which we had, the, which was built with indigenous technology, was not reconstructed, is the uh, is should be the epitaph on uh, on the nationalism of Rajiv Gandhi, whereby he had to be sacrificed. And no government since then has had the courage to take up these issues. Occasionally, these issues have been raised, but no, but no government, not even Congress governments have had the courage to take it up. And uh, what we are seeing today, I identify three core issues which this government has achieved. One is the, the economically the most significant in the present world is deep sea oil extraction in the Bay of Bengal. Chandrayaan is the biggest challenge to global hegemony, the successful Chandrayaan landing, and the Indian uh, proposal for, uh, for human landing in, uh, by 2035. These remain that, that the fact that we are committed to knocking on the thresholds of science, of scientific advance, these two remain the biggest challenge to the emerging world order. 
the Middle East is already in turmoil. We and the Middle East are all involved in the liberalizing of the uh, of the oil economy of the world. And as Israel should uh, well remember, it was Leon Yuri who wrote, "The kingdom of the of heaven runs on on truth; the kingdom of the earth runs on oil." So when you challenge that, or when you become involved in that process, then you should never discount any possibility. And uh, I remember a very significant Indian leader today who told me that uh, Rajiv Ji knew what the stakes were when he took those stances. So anybody who makes those decisions knows what the stakes are and knows what the repercussions can be. One hopes that this time there won't be a flap like uh, like uh, a report sitting in the IB and not being actioned upon by the government of the day. And one sincerely hopes that we will be able to look after the interests of our, of our country and our leaders. The threat, there's no denying the fact that there is a threat. So I think uh, definitely you've raised a very, very alarming and a very serious issue. Of particularly, and I guess, you know, I, mean, I don't know, I, I never came across serious strategic thinkers and IR specialists or even the security experts thinking along these lines. So definitely this is something which is an entirely new perspective and a new line of thought for all of us. And I guess when I, at this time, those lapses are not repeated. And as you rightly mentioned, the reports lying hidden in some IB office or in some other office and not being acted upon, okay, that doesn't happen this time. And uh, very with great difficulty, India has arrived at its finally at its moment. We are in a very sweet spot right now. And India gets its deserved political leadership to this make to make this great leap forward and emerge as a great world power. But yes, once again, thank you very much for joining us today. I would also like to thank our other two panelists, Mr. Joseph and Dr. Michael and Mr. Verma. Uh, once again, you know, before we uh, take leave, you know, I would really like to thank you for bringing this perspective because of the, as a nation which is emerging as a major power, I guess we need, really need to ramp up our security apparatus. And by that, I also mean the long-term security thinking. Somehow, we are not able to you know, forecast, uh, make a good strategic forecast of the dangers which are coming, or mostly we are always preoccupied with what China does or what with what Pakistan does or some kind of terrorist activity in Jammu and Kashmir. But yes, there, there are threats oh. much beyond these immediate actors, you know, and they are having a very long term vision and long term planning and also uh, ideas about you know how to stop India in its tracks. Definitely, exactly. we have a lot more to talk about, and uh, but you know, as we are already running ahead of time, and you know, so I I guess you know, uh, we can take up some of these issues in our future sessions. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.